If you look at the map of the world in the 19th century, one thing that will immediately strike you is that most of Africa and Asia would be colonies. And you might ask yourself, why? Especially, why are they colonies of seemingly small European countries like France or Britain or Belgium? Well, that's the question we will ask ourselves today. In fact, three questions. First of all, where did all that colonization take place? Second of all, why would European countries be interested? And third of all, how was it able to conquer such vast areas? Stay tuned. In some previous videos, we saw that the early wave of colonization around 1500 was mostly focused on the Caribbean, Latin America, and North America. Well, this changed quite a bit as the 19th century went on. The first colony in the Americas to get independence would be right here, the United States, with the Declaration of Independence, July 4, 1776. The second colony to follow suit would be Haiti, with their own Declaration of Independence, January 1, 1804. We have a video about the Haitian Revolution. Uh, in the 1810s and 1820s, much of Latin America followed suit. Uh, Mexico, I think, declared independence in 1811. Brazil, 1822. Uh, this took a while because Spain fought some uh, wars of independence uh, to prevent those countries from getting independence. Uh, but by the 1820s, 1830s, uh, most of Latin America, either Spanish or Portuguese, would be independent, with a few exceptions, like Cuba. The leading figures in those wars of independence would not be George Washington, that's the United States, not Toussaint Louverture, that would be in Haiti, uh, but a man like Simon Bolivar. And if you're not familiar with him, just go to a place like, say, Venezuela, and you'll see his picture everywhere on the banknote, the Bolivar, which nowadays doesn't cost that much, uh, but also in the government buildings, and the name of avenues, posters everywhere. Uh, he is a great national hero, not just there, but also nearby Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia, where the entire country is named after him. And if you want to have a bit of fun, also go and try to look up the entire name of Simon Bolivar uh, and try to pronounce the whole thing. Uh, so the point I'm getting at is that by the 1820s, uh, most of the Americans, North and South, would be independent, with a few exceptions uh, in the Caribbean area. And the United States, uh, specifically President James Monroe in 1823, announced that this would always remain the same. That the United States, according to the Monroe Doctrine, as it would be known, would be opposed to any future European recolonization of the Americas. For the United States to issue such a statement in 1823 was a bit cheeky because the country was not yet a big world power. Uh, but most European countries kind of followed the advice in the decades that followed and refrained from recolonizing Latin America. The big exception would be France that took over Mexico for a few years in the 1860s. So European powers, for the most part, did not intervene in Latin America thereafter, after 1823. So where did they get their colonies in the 19th century? Well, just about everywhere else. Uh, Africa would be the big focus. Uh, the Middle East, by the time of World War I. Uh, South Asia, like India, or Southeast Asia, like Vietnam, and various places in the Pacific. Well, now that we know where that conversation takes place, what about why? What is it that motivated people from France or Britain to go all around the world and colonize other countries? Well, the answer would be a combination of three factors, uh, what we always refer to as the three genes. God, gold, and glory. Let's start with the gold aspect, the search for profit. By the 19th century, Europeans are not that interested in finding sugarcane in the Caribbean. And there's now sugar beet. They're not that interested in finding spices in Indonesia. Spices, uh, their value has gone down quite a bit. The main factor in the 19th century would be the Industrial Revolution. Uh, countries like Britain, later on France, Belgium, Germany, the United States, see a rapid uptick in their production of textiles and steel, and they become quite rich. Uh, how did that impact colonization? Well, in a variety of ways. Uh, for one thing, you have a need for raw materials. Uh, the textile industry, for example, in Britain, would be a big consumer of cotton, and cotton cannot be grown in Britain. The climate is not quite it is. So you would need to get your cotton elsewhere. And two of the places that Britain conquered in the 19th century would be Egypt and India, uh, two of the largest cotton producers in the world. Uh, the 
Belgians are attracted to the Congo because of uh, rubber, the French like to see nickel in New Caledonia, you get the idea. Beyond that, in the process of industrial revolution, you don't need just to have raw materials on the way in, you also need to have customers on the way out. And the salaries in the countries of Northwestern Europe for the working class tend to be set pretty low at the subsistence wage. So there's always a fear that at the production skyrocketed, there would not be enough customers, or at least customers that are not rich enough, to absorb all that excess production. Uh, that was a fear that came both from the far right or the far left. You take somebody like Andrew Carnegie in the US, he spoke of the law of surplus, the notion that industrialized countries always produce more than they can absorb in their domestic market, uh, so they need to export things in other countries. Coming from the far left, uh, a man like Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, the man who masterminded the uh, revolution in Russia in 1917, I wrote a book called Imperialism as the Highest Stage of Capitalism, where he argued that capitalist countries, because, well, bourgeois pigs don't pay their workers enough, have a tendency to produce more than their local market can absorb. And their solution, instead of just raising the wages of their workers, is to go overseas, colonize other countries, and get captive markets. Imperialism would be the highest stage, the logical consequence of capitalism. And uh, it's not surprising then you see countries like Britain getting attracted to India again because that's a huge market of hundreds of millions of customers that would be locked in a kind of mercantilist trade relationship with uh, England and then would absorb uh, vast quantities of finished textile. So whether you're talking about the cotton on the way in, that comes from the tropics, and the customers on the way out, uh, these could be found in the captive markets of the colonies. What about the second G, God? Well, it's also active in the 19th century uh, in a very literal way that people want to spread the word of God. Missionaries are active, especially in Africa. Uh, some of them are Protestant, some of them are Catholic, and there is a bit of a rivalry between the two to get to Africa before the other side does so that you can convert people to the right brand of Christianity. But beyond that, there's a lot of idealism that goes beyond just the religious aspect. By the mid-19th century, most European countries had turned against slavery. They had abolished the slave trade across the Atlantic, and they also had abolished slavery in their colonies, uh, whether it's Haiti or, say, Jamaica, and eventually the United States itself did the same. And with the zeal of new converts, uh, people, especially in Britain, once they realized that slavery was wrong, wanted to impose their views on the rest of the world. And even though the Atlantic slave trade had been brought to an end, uh, slavery still existed within Africa and from Africa to the Middle East. So there are a lot of efforts in the 19th century to uh, send people to Africa to stop the slave trade locally. And one way to do so would be to colonize all these areas. And in that case, uh, you can stop slavery at its source in an idealistic fashion. Uh, more generally, there is a sense in the 19th century of doing right uh, for the people of the colonies, that the colonies are not just a way to make profit, but also to help the people being colonized. That, to use the words of Rudyard Kipling, the colonizers were carrying out the white man's burden. Or to use a French expression, they were doing the mission civilisatrice, the civilizing mission. So the goal of colonization in that sense uh, would be not just to enrich the colonizing power, uh, but to help the people being colonized, uh, to build railroads, uh, to bring the wonders of modern medicine, to spread the French language, the British language, bring Christianity, and altogether uplift the people being colonized. You can see that this attitude is slightly condescending if you think that you need to civilize people, it means that the people being civilized are, well, barbaric in the first place. And you would be right if you would think that. The 19th century also saw uh, the growth of a concept known as scientific racism, and usually it's spelled scientific with bunny ears, uh, and then racism, to show that there was not much that was scientific about it. It's kind of an offshoot of Darwinism, which also appears in the 19th century with the publication of The Origin of the Species in 1857. And you take Darwinism and you apply it uh, to human races, and you try to categorize things, taxonomy is the term, and you try then to rank all these species. And in a way, you start to treat the African race as being some kind of intermediate missing link uh, between other great apes like, say, gorillas and chimps, and us, Homo sapiens. That uh, racism would be uh, strong enough that you would think that non-white races uh, would need to get supervised by the uh, you know, all-knowing great white men. And that's why you go to Asia, and specifically, that's why you go to Africa. 
uh, it's a pretty horrendous period where racism is not uh, the kind of uh, niche ideology that is indefensible in public uh, the way it is nowadays. Uh, it is uh, more of a mainstream ideology among the upper classes in Europe where a president or prime minister uh, could uh, freely make statements that would be considered uh, unacceptable or not PC nowadays. Uh, you even have cases in the 19th century where, or going into the 20th century, uh, where in capitals of Europe uh, you have uh, big international exhibitions. And in those exhibitions, you'll see some human zoos that are set up because you look at lions, you look at apes, and you look at humans, and then you move on to the replica of a pagoda from Vietnam. And it's all just exotic in the very same way. What about the surgery, and that is glory? Uh, glory in that case could be at the national level, more protecting national security interests, or at the individual level of personal glory. Let's start maybe with a personal level. Many of the people that are involved in colonization in the 19th century are people with gigantic egos, but also somewhat limited futures back in Europe. A person like Henry Morton Stanley, we'll talk about him when we get to the Belgian Congo, uh, was born in Wales uh, as a bastard and was pretty much abandoned by his parents. Uh, people like that, they will never get much future at home, whereas if they get to Africa, all of a sudden, they're the big guy around just by virtue of their white skin. And so you have people like, say, Cecil Rhodes, uh, who go to South Africa, he was an Englishman, and they're made a fortune in the diamond business. You have quite a few uh, diamond mines in South Africa or nearby in Botswana. And just as a digression, the present-day company of De Beers, which dominates the diamond business, would be an offshoot of what um, uh, Cecil Rhodes had created way back when in the early 20th century. Uh, Cecil Rhodes is not just a person who goes to Africa to make, a, uh, to make a fortune for himself, but also to make a big name for himself, uh, to give a sense of how uh, narcissistic he was. There's a whole county named after him, Rhodesia, which would correspond to today's Zimbabwe. And his big dream ultimately would be to create a Cape to Cairo uh, string of British colonies, and then a railroad would connect Cape Town, South Africa, all the way to Cairo in Egypt. And you can see, uh, based on that illustration, that he thinks of himself as towering above the continent with one foot in South Africa, one foot in Egypt. Uh, beyond that, the uh, glory can be also at the national level. Uh, people are very proud of being French or British or what have you in the 19th century. Uh, that's a legacy of the French Revolution where the concept of nationalism uh, really came into its own. So one way to express the love of your country is uh, to expand the colonies. Uh, that's especially true of France after 1870 because France lost some uh, territory in Europe, Alsace, and as a way to recover national honor, France is really eager uh, to get colonies in, uh, in Africa. Uh, but Britain and other countries are kind of acting the same way. Uh, the goal in that sense became to uh, paint the map, was the expression. That the more area that you have on the map and that are uh, represented at the color of your colonies, the color of your country, uh, then the prouder you become. In that sense, uh, some areas are taken over not so much because of their value, uh, but simply because they are big. Uh, a dominion like Australia or Canada uh, for Britain would be largely empty, but they look big on the map. Uh, for the French, the whole concept of French West Africa, uh, which is huge on the map. Uh, what's in there? Well, mostly the Sahara Desert, not much value because oil has not been discovered yet there. Uh, so what do you have it just because it looks big on the map? A good example of that would be uh, the Sudan, uh, which where in the 1890s, France and Britain almost go to war over the control of the Sudan. The value of the Sudan is pretty minimal in the grand scheme of things, but again, it looks huge on the map. Uh, so painting the map, uh, that's one aspect. And countries in the 19th century tend to be very proud, uh, or people in general. This is a time when people still do duels. Uh, you tell somebody uh, your mama joke, and the next morning, next thing you know, uh, you're invited at dawn with your witnesses to do pistols at 20 paces. And people also have a strong sense of honor at the international level. And if there's any kind of uh, perceived insult against your country, then you would do the international level of a duel. Uh, there's a case in the 19th century where there's a dispute involving a pastry shop uh, that is French in Veracruz, Mexico. Uh, things get out of hand. The French expect to have some 21-gun salute uh, to the French flag and then some indemnity and the Mexican government doesn't want to follow suit. A war ensues that is called the Pastry War. And that sounds kind of ridiculous, but you have many, many examples of that in the 19th century. 
Uh, it's called uh, gunboat diplomacy. Whenever uh, a weaker country insults you in any way, real or imagined, uh, then you stand in the gunboats and start a mini war until you get received some uh, indemnity and, uh, and an honor uh, to your flag. Uh, so national honor plays a big role, and when we get to French uh, Algeria, you'll see that it all starts with the infamous fly swatter incident. Stay tuned for that one. To talk about your national honor for your country is also a, a way of protecting their national security interests. Uh, if you look at the map of the British Empire, for example, uh, you'll notice that the, the British controlled fairly small places uh, like Singapore, or Aden, or the Suez Canal, or Malta, or Gibraltar. And all these things, if you look at them on the map, you'll notice they're extremely small. But you also notice that they are at strategic points uh, in the Straits of Malacca on the way to China, or not too far from the Red Sea to control going through the Middle East, or at choke points in the Mediterranean so that you can go uh, around Spain or between Italy and Tunisia. Uh, so for Britain to control all these different places uh, was a form of uh, protecting access to the world for what was at that time the largest navy in the world. So if you can combine all that, uh, the economic interests, uh, the more idealistic aspect with its ugly undertone of racism, and then uh, the glory for individuals or for the country as a whole and the national security, you have all the primary motives that pushed Europeans to expand throughout the 19th century. So we've answered the answer, the question uh, where and why, what about the how, which is in my mind the key question. Because it's one thing to say, oh, I'd love to conquer the world. Uh, doing it is a bit more complicated, especially when you look at a country like, say, Belgium, compared with the Belgian Congo, which is so much larger, or Britain, and then you compare it to India. How come one country conquered the other on the other side of the world? Uh, well, it's a combination of European countries being particularly strong at that time and other countries being quite weak. Uh, we've had some, some videos explaining how places like the Ottoman Empire or Mughal India or Qing China in the 1700s, 1800s kind of stagnate economically and fail uh, to develop their industry and technology, and so they become easy prey for foreign colonization. Uh, you have also in some cases religious divides between, say, Muslims and Hindus in India, or uh, ethnic uh, disputes as in the uh, Belgian Congo, and that means that the uh, local country is not able to present a united front against a sustained European effort to colonize them. Uh, that plays a role as well. Uh, what I've called in previous videos the non-rise of the non-West uh, allows Western countries uh, to come in in the 19th century and colonize. In the case of Africa, you also have the uh, long-term after-effects of the Atlantic slave trade, where many of the areas of the coastline are depopulated by the slave trade, and many of the kingdoms are destroyed by internecine battles connected to the slave trade, and that allows at a later stage uh, the Europeans to uh, step in and, and colonize those areas. Uh, beyond that, it's not just a matter of uh, non-Western weaknesses, it's also a matter of Western strengths. Uh, the early 1800s saw the Industrial Revolution in Britain, France, Belgium, Germany, later the US, and not surprisingly, these are the very same powers you see being the main colonial powers of the 19th century. Uh, clearly because they have an economic interest to do so, you find raw materials, but also because they have the economic wherewithal to do so. They have sustained, uh, they have accumulated enough wealth that they can afford to put armies in the field on the other side of the world. Uh, the Industrial Revolution is also connected by uh, technological advances, uh, such as in the field of transportation and communication, and that makes a huge difference. Uh, if you are to conquer Britain, and all of a sudden there is a major revolt there, which is what happens in 1857, uh, what do you do? Uh, when a previous century, it would have been pretty difficult to respond, because sending a message all the way back to Britain would have taken forever. You would have sent a, a person on foot, on horseback, to the coastline of India, and then waited for some kind of sailing ship to show up, waited for the monsoon winds to come, sailed all around the coast of Africa to Britain, and then uh, again on foot, on horseback to London uh, to uh, give the news, and then you gather up an army slowly and you just repeat the process. Uh, at best, you might get a response within a year or two, and by that point, Britain might have lost India. Uh, by 1857, you might have a telegraph line connecting uh, Britain all the way to Asia. So in a split second, you will have the news of the rebellion in Britain. And with the railroad, you can summon troops much faster, you now embark on a steamship, which will go much faster and more reliably than a sailing ship. They'll go, uh, by the end of the 19th century, through the Suez Canal, so the trip will be faster. And again, within India, you have a network of uh, railroads to, uh, to get your troops around. You also have the advance 
uh, the advent of uh, more advanced artillery pieces, exploding shells, rifles that are no longer muzzle-loaded but with cartridges, uh, repeating rifles, and uh, the other side, most importantly, does not. Uh, one side uh, by the late 19th century has a Maxim gun, which is an early version of a machine gun, uh, the other side does not. Uh, one example that would be key in explaining the kind of imbalance of forces that you have by the late 19th century would, the, would be the Battle of the Omdurman, and we're back in the Sudan, uh, where one British column uh, in the process of conquering the Sudan was attacked uh, by the locals trying to defend their country. Up the top of my head, it's uh, 8,000 British forces on one side and 50,000 Sudanese forces on the other side. So if you're the British forces way deep inside enemy territory and surrounded by so many locals who can draw on even more resources than you need to, you'd think you're pretty much lost. And I'm trying to be polite about that. But one side has all this modern weaponry and the other does not. Uh, by the end of the day, the British lost 47 men and the uh, Sudanese forces lost about 10,000. So it's a completely lopsided battle where the British, even though they're far outnumbered, end up uh, winning a resounding victory. And you have similar battles uh, elsewhere, like say uh, against the Zulu in South Africa. Uh, technology makes the difference, at least in the 19th century. The last thing to uh, ponder is whether you can survive in a climate, because we've seen a lot in the class that in world history what matters is often disease. Uh, the Colombian exchange, for example, uh, underpinned a lot of the conquest of the Caribbean. Well, in Latin America, uh, the Europeans had come with diseases like smallpox that Native Americans had no immunity against, and had facilitated the conquest of, say, Mexico or Peru. Uh, in Africa, the process was reversed, because you have a lot of tropical diseases in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, things like malaria, yellow fever, that the Europeans have no immunity against. And so for the longest time, uh, Africa was known in Europe as the white man's graveyard, meaning that uh, many would-be conquerors or explorers would go there and catch some local disease and, and then die. And that's largely wh what explains why, for the longest time, Africa is not uh, colonized. Uh, things change by the late 19th century, uh, where you have some progress in European medicine. Uh, for one thing, in the 1890s, Europeans found discovered that yellow fever and malaria are spread by two different species of mosquitoes. So now you can take uh, prophylactic measures to get a mosquito net or something. Later on, they develop a vaccine against uh, yellow fever. To protect yourself against malaria in the 19th century, people tried to protect themselves from mosquito, but they also discovered that the bark of one tree from South America, quinine, could also protect you. And if you take it, uh, then uh, you could uh, have a greater chance of surviving malaria, uh, at least to some extent. And so it became possible uh, for Europeans to stay in the field longer, and instead of just coming to the coast and buying slaves and leaving as soon as they could, which was the norm in previous centuries, now they can come here for the long run and actually colonize uh, places in Africa or India that would have been very hostile, uh, epidemiologically speaking, in, in previous centuries. Uh, the one problem with quinine is that it's very bitter, and so it's not fun to, to have it. The British found a solution to that. They mixed it with gin, and that's where we get the origin of the gin and tonic, the tonic that you buy in the supermarket. has some quinine in there and will protect you to some extent from malaria. And so to the answer, why is it that Europeans were able to conquer India or other tropical areas in the 19th century? The answer is the gin and tonic. Well, uh, that's it for the general overview. We'll now have a number of videos where we're delving deeper into some individual cases. Uh, British India, French Algeria, the infamous Belgian Congo, and also US imperialism in the Caribbean. Stay tuned. <laughs> Oh, my God.